This is a presentation of the Center for Advanced Study at the University of Illinois. For over 50 years, the Center for Advanced Study has brought together scholars from diverse disciplines and backgrounds, encouraging and rewarding excellence in all areas of academic inquiry at Illinois, one of the nation's premier public universities. For more information about this presentation and other center activities, please visit cas.illinois.edu. Tarleton is an associate professor of communication at Cornell. Oh, I'm sorry. You just I, gave me tenure. I just gave Tarleton tenure. Um, I'm sure it will happen very shortly. <laughs> um, so um, Tarleton is assistant professor of the Department of Communication at Cornell University. He has um, affiliation within the Department of Science Technology Studies and Information Science Program. Um, in addition to these appointments, he's also a non-residential fellow with the Center for Internet and Society at Stanford University School of Law. His research covers a broad variety of areas from media, technology, law, and culture. And I think his work brings together these bits and pieces in very interesting ways. His publications have improved, um, been seen in Information Society, Social Studies of Science, New Media Society, Triple C, and um, Inside Higher Education. He is the author of the really well-received and um, a few um, awards. Um, the book titled Wired Shut um, was published from MIT Press in 2007. Um, and most importantly, I have to thank Tarleton for actually making it here. Um, he traveled from Ithaca, and usually you don't get out of Ithaca. He made it to Detroit, and his flight was canceled. And like a true trooper that he is, he flew to St. Louis and drove from St. Louis to our wonderful town of Champaign-Urbana. Um, <laughs> just in time to make it to the radio program um, this morning. Um, and I hope some of you caught him on the radio. He's really great. Um, so his title today, the talk you'll give, is called The Politics of Platforms. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome Tarleton Gillespie. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Ray. It's, it's really a pleasure to be in, in this series and to be here speaking to you. Uh, and I'll pass a hat around. If each of you put a dollar in it, you'd pay for my speeding ticket from St. Louis. So I'd really appreciate that. That'd be really good. I was hurrying. Um, so uh, the Technoscience Initiative allows us, I think, to think of a number of, of elements. Um, my particular element is thinking about the new media and information environment in which we live uh, and the role that providers and cultural intermediaries are playing in the kind of information we have access to, the kind of content that we encounter, um, and the shape of the public discourse that we're uh, encountering. Um, I start with the assumption that uh, we know how, or we have for a long time, asked questions about the role that broadcasters, publishers, uh, and other sort of media companies play in the subtle and sometimes not so subtle shaping of the information that we encounter. So we know how to ask questions about uh, the newspaper industry. We know how to ask questions about the television industry. What choices do they make? What kind of economic pressures are they under? Um, what kind of ideological commitments may they have? And how would that uh, shape the kind of selection process, uh, the routines that they engage in, the kind of uh, material that's going to make sense to them that ends up being on our primetime schedule, on the front page of our newspaper, uh, on our radio broadcast? We are entering a world in which some of, and increasingly more of, the information, entertainment, and sort of public discourse that we encounter are coming to us through uh, a new set of cultural intermediaries. Uh, online providers, search engines, um, social network sites that are increasingly the hosts not only of the sort of information we encounter, but the kind of cultural and public discourse that we engage in. So if we think about the way we find out political information, the way we find out about cultural ideas, uh, the themes and, I, and representations and stories that we encounter, more and more of that information is coming to us through these digital environments. 
So the proposition is that we need to begin to ask the same kinds of questions, or at least the questions motivated by the same concerns. How do these organizations subtly shape what we say, what we hear, what we encounter? And I would argue that while we have a language for thinking about the role that traditional media played as a sort of gatekeeper, right, from all the things that could be told, from all the things that could be reported, from all the stories that are available, a selection process of what is most interesting, what is most relevant, what is most newsworthy, and the way that that selection process um, obscures or uh, is just sort of the surface level of a selection process about what is um, publicly necessary, what is relevant, what is uh, to be heard. That we don't have the language for thinking about these same questions when it comes to online media environments. The business model is different. Uh, the kinds of interventions that can be made are different. And our experience of these online sites are quite different than our experience of traditional publishers and broadcasters. Um, there are a number of people beginning to ask these kinds of questions. They're asking them from their own uh, sort of disciplinary backgrounds. Um, so this is Neil Netanel, just as one example, asking about whether we should begin to think about Google, um, Facebook, as kinds of monopolies. The way that that question um, brought into focus a set of concerns about the media environment when we asked it about Disney, Viacom, Time Warner, et cetera. Now that said, if we can bring this sort of lens and say, <clears throat> these are our cultural providers, they are increasingly prominent and important, they are um, concentrated in, in at least one version of the classic sense that we mean by media concentration, then we can begin to ask those kinds of questions. However, um, the, the way these systems work is quite different than uh, how traditional publishers and traditional broadcasters work. Um, so if they play a different role, if they're um, governance of information is fundamentally different, then perhaps the questions that we learn to ask about traditional media providers don't apply, or they have to be asked in different terms. So for instance, um, we're dealing with, on the, on the first count, an emphasis on user-generated content. So it may be that the relationship that media providers had with professional media production, the closeness that that represented, was part of the issue about what then became the broad cultural discourse. The rules may be different when it comes to hosting or providing space for user-generated content. Some of these sites are trying to manage being both. So does that change the game of how they um, provide and how they make choices? More important, um, the selection process that a newspaper would go through or a TV network would go through or a movie studio or a record producer would go through um, was about uh, drawing down all of the available talent that they had located or constructed to a very narrow set of commodities, right? This band, this movie, the 10 shows on prime time, the 20 releases this summer. Um, and that selection process was both a benefit, right? They could have an editorial value, they could cultivate talent, um, but it might also be the place where uh, limitations or sort of ideological emphases could play in. Arguably, Google, YouTube, Flickr, Facebook play a much different role. Their business model is to offer as much as possible. In fact, it makes sense for their business to offer, or at least claim that they can offer, all. Right? So a side example, a perfect example, is that Google began scanning books. You may have heard of this. Um, and they set up a, a system where it said if people want to opt out of this system, they can do that. And the publishers cried and said, well, copyright is about an opt-in. You have to get my permission. It made sense for Google to try to build their business so that the most number of books would end up in that system. Because if they could say, this is the library, this is everything you'd ever need. Or if they can say about their search engine, this is the web. Right? And those of us who study these things know is of course a, a, a fraction of the web. Um, but if this is everything you need, then they are the best service. They are better than the service that provides less than everything you need. So their business is not so much selection as it is inclusion. So maybe the kinds of um, choices that got made in an editorial process, in a selective process, don't matter here. It's a possibility. And finally, these sites are catering to um, niche communities, although many of them are trying to build a business that's about uh, incorporating as many of these niche communities as possible. They're based on advertising that is still targeted. So maybe the kinds of concerns that we faced about traditional advertising, where if you're gonna advertise in front of seven million people, you need your content and your advertising to be of a certain style. It can't be politically challenging, it can't be threatening, it can't be inappropriate. 
maybe in a sort of targeted advertising model where niche communities set their kind of cultural norms, maybe this is not such a concern. Here's a counterpoint. December 2008, YouTube releases a, a press release called, I will suggest ironically, a YouTube for all of us, in which they suggest, as you can see here, this is just sort of the first paragraph of it, um, that they are trying to set a sort of new policy about the health and um, tone of the community. And they're concerned not about pornography, which they've already had rules about and already sort of remove when it's complained about, um, but another category of things, sort of profanity, sexually suggestive content, things that don't amount to the level of pornography but are nonetheless maybe troubling to an element of the community. And they suggest that they're going to start um, drawing a, a slightly stricter line about what can be on the YouTube archive and what can't. And they'll engage in three tactics, you'll see. So um, one is that they will remove some things that they think are inappropriate. Two is that they will um, put certain videos behind an age barrier. You have to click through and prove that you're 18. You have to be a registered user of YouTube, which means you indicated what your age was. And three, and I find this intriguing, and we'll come back to this, um, is that they will algorithmically demote certain videos. All right, we'll come back to that. Here's an example. If we like to think that YouTube, Facebook, Flickr, online media platforms are wide open access environments for all. Anything can be uploaded, anything can be provided. If Google is sort of our access to the entire web, right, then this kind of question about an online media platform making decisions about what's appropriate and inappropriate um, may be surprising. Maybe this doesn't surprise you. Maybe you knew this was here all along. Um, in their sort of business model, there is a tension between wanting to include everything, being comprehensive, being the archive of all things. If you want video online, you go to YouTube. That's it, right? That would be the position they'd like to offer. And cultivating and protecting a sense of what YouTube is and worrying about these kind of edges of what's inappropriate, what doesn't belong, what exceeds the norms and guidelines of a site. So not only is this, if you want to argue, it's censorship, in a classic sense, right? Here's something that someone was trying to make available and YouTube decided it was inappropriate, took it off. Um, and which makes them much more like traditional media providers than maybe they would care to admit or would like to suggest in their business plan. Um, but it also suggests that there are some new tactics that we might want to think about. Some new ways in which um, what is available, what is visible, what is um, in front of us and what is not um, are managed. So not just removal and sort of age ratings, but also some technical mechanisms. So this is the kind of language that I would argue we do not have, uh, sorry, this is the kind of tactics that I would argue we don't have a language for. That the traditional questions about gatekeeping and about sort of ideological commitments of media providers in a traditional sense don't quite work here. But that we are faced with a situation where we are encouraged not to think about that question at all. We are, are offered up the Google search engine or YouTube's archive or Facebook's social network site as simply a tool to all the things we ever want, right? Simply a tool to things most relevant or a potential access to all things available. And how we ask questions about the, how the fact that it is not exactly that, how we have both the promise of everything and not everything at the same time, how that promise has been cultivated and then, if that is in fact a promise that is not seen through, how there are choices in fact being made. Where do these sites draw the lines? What are their tactics for enforcing the rules that they impose? What are the implications of the choices they make? How can we as sort of um, information citizens who are depending on these sites, and these sites are taking up the mantle of being uh, environments for political discussion, environments for cultural discussion, how can we begin to um, raise questions about how choices are made, hold them accountable to the public discourse that they offer to host. So in this talk, I'm gonna mostly focus on this second question. I wanna just sort of, uh, as an aside, talk about the first. This um, research that I'm presenting, in some ways, came out of an interaction I had in the classroom, where I was doing a class that was trying to bring traditional mass media questions to the new media environment. And I did a week on media concentration, ownership, and you know, what happens if Disney is vertically uh, integrated and, and, uh, and what have you. And the students seemed to know how to argue that. I don't know if they bought it, but there was a, an understanding of the concerns you might uh, raise about that. And then I said, okay, well, what about Google? And the sense was, well, Google simply gives us access to our stuff, right? It's simply a tool that gives us access to the web. 
and it filters stuff for us by relevance, right? And so the, the question that needed to be asked was both, how did that become such a compelling understanding of what these tools offer, that they could see the critical question around traditional media industries and not necessarily bring that same question to another very powerful commercially oriented set of companies? And then let's peel the curtain back and say, well, how is this working? How are these lines being drawn? To answer the first question, just as an aside, I think it's very important to think about the rhetoric that these sites engage in. How do these sites position themselves to the public, to their users, to lawmakers, um, to uh, their, the companies they compete with, to advertisers? How do they position themselves as a kind of information service? What are they claiming to do? Um, and how is it that they manage to um, sometimes proclaim that they intervene in content, while other times proclaiming that they do not intervene? Right? How do they promise to be everything and not everything at the same time? Um, and I play around with it a little bit with the idea of uh, these sites calling themselves platforms. So uh, briefly, this term is a term that has emerged as a description for some of these online media sharing sites. It was a term that in some ways until recently belonged to kind of a computational metaphor. Right? So the PC is a platform or the Linux operating system is a platform because you can build tools upon it. And that was the, what the computational sense of it was. And obviously a longer history about this being kind of an you know, architectural platform, the you know, subway platforms and oil platforms and platform shoes. Um, and the political notion, right? the platform of a, of a political party or a political candidate. Um, or the figurative notion, right? this is a platform of opportunity. I can you know, climb the corporate ladder from this job as a kind of platform. That as these sites adopted this term, and more importantly than the term, adopted this claim about themselves, um, they were tapping into the connotations of those terms. Something to be built upon, so a kind of active, productive, useful element. But at the same time, a surface that is both flat, open, accessible, right, lifts everyone up. And the kind of connotations that were available in, those ter in that term was a very compelling way to situate themselves as serving a set of users, but not picking and choosing between them. Right, that this space is accessible to all, it's accomplishing something, but it's not a selection process. And I took a look in a previous paper, which I'm happy to share with people if they're interested, um, at the way that YouTube used this term in their own self-descriptions, in their press releases, in, uh, in you know, talks given by the CEOs, in the sort of promotional material they offer to users. And what I found was that this term did a whole lot of really interesting work for them. It presented them as providing something to a very different set of Practitioners. So when they spoke to users, they said, broadcast yourself. We are a platform from which you can be heard. When they spoke to media partners, they said, here's a platform of opportunity, right? You can distribute your content. You can be featured in our site, not the open access platform, but a chance, an opportunity. To advertisers, they said, you are a platform to get your brand in front of the right eyeballs. And to lawmakers, sometimes they said, we're a platform. You need to give us special protections. We need net neutrality, for instance, because we allow free speech. We allow um, users to be heard. We are a platform that supports people. Then when they say, well, should you be held liable for copyright infringement, they say, we are merely a platform. Right? Users put things on there. We're a platform, just like if you know your sort of history of regulation. The telephone industry says we're a conduit. We don't pick and choose. Right? So that structural metaphor is very powerful. So that term, and again, I don't want to overplay the term, but it's indicative of the way that these sites are trying to present themselves, trying to offer up a kind of service. Right? That they are an open access archive that is open to all, and yet they are also a structure that facilitates. But they are not one that picks and chooses. So now we take to the second question. How do these sites, in fact, intervene? What choices are they making? What do their policies look like? What are they taking down or putting behind age barriers? What are the kinds of things that these sites will disallow? How do they intervene? What are the techniques for intervening? What are their rationalizations for intervening? How do they describe why they should intervene and remove things or segregate things or take things out of the archive? And finally, what are the implications of doing so? So how can we unveil the process and policies of these sites to reveal that these are, in fact, choices? And to ask questions not that selection is necessarily bad or that the criteria are necessarily bad, but that they are sort of open for conversation, that they are a point at which we could ask questions about their active role 
in constructing the public discourse that we encounter. Now, it's interesting to think about how um, most of us don't ever encounter this kind of constraint when we're dealing with these sites. So probably most of us who have posted to Flickr or added something to Facebook have not had anything taken down, have not had anything removed. Um, most of our encounter with these sites never run into these barriers. Most of the time when you put a search term into Google, you get a lot of stuff back. You are overwhelmed by the, uh, by the abundance of offerings, which discourages us for thinking about how that is not everything, how things have been removed, how things are not available. And it's only those people who have run into these barriers Right, have run into um, content being removed, content being put behind age grades, um, that are beginning to recognize that these sites make selections. So for most of us, we don't experience these as selectors. We don't experience them as constrained. We experience them as bounteous. And I think that raises a challenge for why this is such a hard question to ask, why it's difficult to sort of wonder about the choices they make. Okay. So how is it these sites shape public discourse? What kind of um, constraints are they imposing and what are the sort of rationalizations? Well, there's a very particular um, tricky deal that needs to be struck between users who would like to post their content. I'm thinking about amateur users at this point, although we want to be smart about what these sites really host. But a tricky um, balance that's struck between uh, the user who wants to post something and the organization that would like to provide the space from which that can be hosted. Um, there is definitely a commitment to the kind of ethos of user-generated content that suggests that there is sort of an openness to this, um, that stuff should be available, that free speech should be honored. And at the same time, they have to make a business out of this, whether that's an advertising-supported business or a subscription-supported business. Um, they have to manage to make this profitable or sustainable. And they're inside of a legal environment and a sort of competitive business environment that makes certain things um, unavailable to them, certain things treacherous to them. Um, and this is part of uh, the story that Jonathan Zittrain has been trying to explore, where these sites, as they become elements of cultural discourse, as they grow, as they expand, um, they find that they have to draw boundaries around the very phenomenon that they're capitalizing on. Right? They have to govern this content in some way. So what you find when you speak to uh, the representatives of these platforms about how they engage in content policy, content management, you see a very interesting combination of tensions. So first and foremost, it's the first thing that any of them say, uh, commitment to free speech, right? That free speech is an important value, that that's one of the things we want to honor. Um, and I don't mean to suggest that that's a sort of um, vacant promise. I think it is genuine or genuine to the degree that it can be held. But it's in competition with a set of other tendencies. Um, protecting a safe community, uh, protecting a brand, and the audience that sees that brand as valuable, reliable, and of a certain sort, legal liabilities that they have to face, um, and a sort of business imperative that they need to balance. So how is it that they make choices that can somehow live at the meeting point of all those things? And you can see this tension if you look. I'll just use Facebook as an example. Um, so in their principles document, they uh, have a number of promises about what Facebook is dedicated to, um, saying things like uh, being committed to the freedom to share whatever users want and to the free flow of information. Um, and if you go to their terms of service, you'll see a not surprising uh, different tone about what can't be shared, what can't be distributed. This is not surprising and this is not unique to Facebook in thinking about um, how a site can both promise to host as much as possible and have to draw boundaries around what's available. So if we want to map some of these policies and, and look at sort of how, especially the techniques of their enforcement, um, raise questions, we need to think about um, how these sites can justify making choices at all and what kind of tactics make sense inside of those justifications. Let me back up one. So, um, one tactic that you see in a number of these sites is the proactive patrolling and removal of content. Uh, some sites, not all of them, are willing to uh, set up a, number, a, a large set of employees whose sole job it is to go through the content that's been uploaded to their site. 
Um, Facebook, for instance, uh, a lot of them don't like to talk about how many people they have. Facebook has, is uh, an exception. They have 50 people who are dedicated full time to content policy. Part of what they have to do, and this especially became important after Facebook allowed photos to be uploaded and videos to be uploaded, is going through content and finding things that violate their community guidelines. Um, pornography, hate speech, excessive violence, um, revealing other people's private information, harassment, spam. The list is not entirely surprising. Looking through content on their own, making choices about what things violate their rules, uh, and removing them. And it's very interesting to think about beyond the sort of obvious cases, right? Someone posting, you know, hardcore porn onto their Facebook profile, the tricky sort of gray areas where they have to draw some lines. So Facebook, as, again, as an example, and LiveJournal before it, uh, ran into some trouble when they started taking down images of women breastfeeding. Their rule was no nudity in your photography. Uh, and they drew a line where they said, okay, breastfeeding was uh, within that bounds. It was beyond the rule. Uh, and a number of users protested, saying that um, this is inappropriate to call this nudity. It's a socially viable thing to represent and photograph. Uh, and whether your politics fall on either side of whether that's appropriate, this has been a long-standing cultural debate about the sort of public exposure of breastfeeding uh, in public spaces, in media representations, and now in Facebook. This is an interesting example because people began to create protest pages on Facebook, and Facebook did roll back their policy a little bit. And it got into the MPA ratings board murkiness of whether you could see edges of nipples and what have you, right? So um, some pretty murky lines in the sand about what's appropriate and inappropriate. Um, but here's a place where um, a site is making proactive decisions based on uh, a guideline established about nudity, as one example. Um, and ending up treading into a space that is culturally contentious. And if this policy had gone unquestioned, then this would have been, I would argue, a significant intervention into the representability of breastfeeding, right? Whether this is a legitimate thing that can be shown or a thing that's supposed to be hidden because it is vaguely or deeply inappropriate, right? So the policies that are being imagined here um, are treading into the territory of open contentious debates about what counts as appropriate and inappropriate and who that affects. So one, uh, one tactic is removal and proactive removal. There's a real tension in these sites between being proactive and reactive. I'll talk about that more in a minute. So a second way that these sites engage in um, the moderation of content, I would argue, is through the setting of norms. So Flickr, for example. Flickr hosts hardcore pornography. I'm not just talking about artistic nudity, I'm talking about hardcore porn. Now you would never know it if you arrived at this site and didn't know exactly how to go find it. I didn't know it for a long time, I was quite surprised to locate it. Part of the way that you would never know that this site has hardcore pornography is the way that the site presents itself. So when you arrive at Flickr for the first time, it's a very sort of clean design and the photo that's exhibited is almost always uh, kind of a semi-professional, high-quality photography image. It's a landscape, it's a flower, right? It's an animal jumping, it's a close-up of a beautiful person, right? It has all the markings of, if you were an amateur photographer aspiring to be very good and you want to distribute your content, this is the place to go. And that's in part because that's where it emerged. That was its sort of original um, destination. That doesn't speak to the fact that lots of Flickr images are drunken party scenes, or family snapshots, or blurry images, or um, copyrighted images, or um, anime characters snapshotted out of games, or hardcore pornography. But the ability to um, educate the user, the new user, into what this site is for is very important. Right? I don't want to uh, overlook that. There's another way that Flickr manages um, its content, uh, they age grade or they age rate or appropriate rate um, their content. So it used to be called NIPSA, not in the public search area. They've sort of stopped using those terms. But as a Flickr user, when you post photos, you're supposed to flag them as safe, moderate, or restricted. And they have this nice sort of, um, uh, sort of breezy way of explaining it. It's not sort of a, a you know, it's like, if anyone can look at this, that's safe. If, you know, you be a little hesitant about showing to your nephew, that's moderate. And if you wouldn't even show it to Uncle Joe, then it's restricted, right? Um, and Flickr can proactively go in and change your ratings if they think you have misrated or failed to rate some of your images. Um, if you have rated an image as restricted, 
then users who go into the Flickr search page can't find it. They can turn off safe search, which again, um, you may not even know is there. Oop. So when you turn off safe search, now you have access to all three categories. And you put in your search term, and if it's the correct search term, then you'll find the things you're looking for. Um, any group of photos that has been classified together, if one image is restricted, the whole group is restricted. Right? So um, the, the dependence on users, but the ability to intervene on whether users are accurately measuring, you know, flagging these things, um, allows them to create these sort of barriers. I kind of think about it as um, the, the porn's in the back theory of, you know, the, in the sort of old video store, there was the regular room, and then there was the beaded curtain, and you kind of knew it was there, right? You knew it was part of their business, but you didn't really see it. Except here, it's immersed in the archive, except you can't even tell it's there until you know to know it's there. It's a very interesting uh, twist on the old model, because in the old video store, you kind of knew that was part of their business. Even if you never went in there, you understood that that was part of that service. Here, it's possible to navigate Flickr as a regular user for years and never see some of these images. Right? So a combination of rating, uh, which is a pretty traditional mechanism, um, removal of content in Facebook's example, a pretty traditional mechanism, but merged with the ability to use that information as part of the search mechanism, right? to box out certain kinds of content. Um, so for Flickr, be able to sort of cater to both communities. You want the site to be hardcore porn, you can do that. You restrict and you know it's only going to be seen by certain kinds of people. You want it to be, you know, pro-am photography that has landscapes and flowers, then you can make it that too. There's two lessons here. So one is that um, the kinds of tactics that we saw for publishers, the kinds of tactics that we saw for television networks are alive and well. Making choices, based on assumptions about the audience's comfort level with certain kinds of material, um, the implications of being a site that hosts that kind of material, something that's too violent or too sexual, um, and the sort of um, rough categorization by age and appropriateness to try to divide your audience into um, groups that can see certain kinds of things and can't see others. With the twist that um, we're in this sort of what Clay Shirky calls the publish then filter world, so the stuff goes up and then it has to be sort of measured or take down or removed, Facebook promises that if you flag content, they also have a flagging mechanism, that it'll be responded to in 24 hours. That's a pretty impressive claim considering it is now the um, largest archive of photography in the world uh, and that this stuff is being put up in something like three million photos a month. Right? There's a huge amount of content being added all the time, but a promise that a flagged piece of content will be responded to within 24 hours. Um, also combined with this idea that you can merge the categorization or the rating system with a kind of search mechanism that then removes or makes invisible. But here's an additional twist. So um, Flickr began getting complaints from Singapore, from Hong Kong, and from Korea about its inappropriate content. It also got complaints from Germany about its inappropriate content. Uh, and they were wondering what to do with this. Now one possibility is that you would then say, let's make nation-specific logins, let's have different rules for users to abide by the laws that are upheld in particular nations. Can be done, other sites do it, right? Technically kind of a challenging thing, a pain in the butt, but they could do that. Flickr made a different decision. If you are in Singapore, Hong Kong, or Korea, you can't get out of safe search mode. Can't do it. If you're in Germany, you can get out of safe search mode to moderate level, but not restricted level. Right? So one of the interesting lessons here is that a technique developed and used for one kind of reason, it's very easy to lift that model for another kind of reason. So what are the implications of any citizen in Germany simply not having access to that content? And depending on how it appears, and I can't tell you how it appears um, to a user, not even knowing that's possible. Right? Not even knowing that the porn's in the back. Right? So the technique can be lifted and brought to a national level, not just to an age distinctive level. This is reminiscent of a set of questions that have plagued uh, sort of free speech thinking for decades. Um, just to take an aside into the sort of First Amendment part of this. Uh, the First Amendment, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, suggested that the government cannot engage in restrictions of speech, except for certain kinds of uh, extreme examples or limitations, that they can enact no law that will inhibit speech. 
But as um, we entered into the middle of the 20th century, there was beginning to be a question about how the private organizations that provide information and that host speech, how their decisions may restrict or limit speech. Broadcasters, publishers, but also shopping mall owners, right? So the degree that the public space is supposed to be one where the government can't intervene and say, uh, impose a law that restricts speech. What happens if the shopping mall becomes the public sphere? What if town squares are, are disappearing? What if people are thinking about the shopping mall as a public environment? Should there be the same speech rules there where there's now a countervailing interest, where there's a private owner who has a sort of economic interest in making this a hospitable and sort of commercially viable space? And can you impose rules on broadcasters that say, well, even though broadcasters get to choose whatever they want to um, broadcast, that's sort of within their business model, we have expectations based on that because we also need that media environment to host the public discourse. And for better or for worse, they are a powerful environment for that content. And what we decided was there were some kinds of limits to their restrictions, right? So we could hold broadcasters um, uh, to a set of licensing agreements that um, shopping mall owners can restrict speech, but they can't restrict speech selectively by your topic, right? So time, place, manner restrictions. Now we've got a question, I would argue, that almost combines the two. Private information providers that are inc increasingly dominant as the places that we find content, making decisions about what can and cannot be available, that whether or not you agree on the sort of motivations and the content do limit speech to some degree. Can we then expect something of them that says, well, they are now the hosts of the public space. They are now the keepers, the curators of the public discourse. So how would a free speech question apply when we think about online media platforms? It's one thing to think about the sites that host content and the kind of um, information regulation that has gone on around content sort of applying to this new environment. Right? These are publishers and broadcasters and now these are online media platforms. What kind of decisions about appropriate content and inappropriate content emerge? What's interesting here is that um, the regulation of content in these spaces is always and already the governance of people. Right? Whether or not you're talking about social networks like Facebook or an online media sharing platform like YouTube, you're also governing who can be there, what their norms are, whether their norms fit with the site's guidelines. And so now we're thinking about, in some ways, a parallel to the governance of other kinds of online environments like virtual worlds, like Wikipedia. Right? And there are a number of people who are beginning to think about how is it that sites that provide space for people's interactions being governed, and that these sites happen to be interactions that happen around expression, content provision. We're dealing with a bigger question about models of governance. That as we think about the, um, the way that social interactions happen through information, and inside of mediated environments, that the rules that govern the space, the rules that govern the right to participate, the rules that govern appropriate interactions between people, and then in these cases, sometimes you know, interaction between people through content, through expression, um, are, are spaces that are taking into account, grappling with, and in some ways driving the way we think about models of governance, models of democratic participation. Right. Now, these decisions are being made um, in practical environments under economic pressure. Um, it's not as if the people who run Second Life or the people who run YouTube or the people who run World of Warcraft are sitting back and philosophically contemplating how democracy has worked over the last millennia and how it should work uh, in this environment. Um, they have discussions about how these things work, but they're, they're inside a very constrained environment where they have to get these policies in, into play. They've got to you know, satisfy their sort of investors and their economic bottom line. They've got to deal with sort of fires that emerge from particular uses and particular situations. Um, nevertheless, the models of governance that are being established and the norms of governance that are being established, especially online, um, to the degree that they become part of the common practice of the way we interact with media, and interact with people online, um, are in some ways establishing what participation will look like, what models of governance are appropriate in these environments.
these platforms face, when they think about how to regulate community, face an interlocking set of challenges. Some of these sites start out with relatively selective communities, small niche communities that emerge. Facebook starting with university students. Um, LiveJournal starting with particular groups of sort of active bloggers. Um, both catering to small communities that have a set of particular norms that may not be shared by the entire public, and as they try to open up their business to multiple communities, as they get sort of invaded by communities they didn't expect, as they try to make a business that includes the public in some sort of broader sense, um, how to abide by the community they're meaning to host. Uh, these sites have to handle those who simply want to break the rules, the trolls. Uh, so YouTube has a, a regular problem with a group of people um, on a site called 4chan. Um, you may have heard of this. So 4chan is a sort of uh, uh, online anonymous uh, troublemaking site uh, where they like to come up with these kind of uh, pranks and technical uh, uh, trickery. And one of the things they like to do on a regular basis with YouTube is have all their users upload videos that look like legitimate videos and then there's porn stuck in the middle somewhere. And they put it in their private environment so it's not really visible yet and then on a single moment they make everything public and then they rate each other's videos highly so suddenly <laughs> the site is swarmed with pornography. Um, and so suddenly, you know, they, they sort of say, Oh, are you beating? Oh, oh, it's porn day, right? <laughs> um, so, so facing community, both in the sense of the community's attempts to establish norms that belong to itself, the competition, the clash between communities, and the arrival of people who uh, in, intend to mess with community. Um, and, as I said, sort of handling the spirit of user-generated content, so honoring uh, the, the sort of ethos of the internet, whatever that is right now, of sort of allowing things to emerge, right, and, and not binding content too closely. Um, YouTube is a very interesting example in this case. YouTube um, insists that they do not do any proactive uh, checking of content, that they never look at a video uh, until it's been flagged by a user. So um, in the sort of uh, video space, if you haven't seen it already, any video you're watching, you can flag as inappropriate. If you flag it, then you get a sort of pull-down menu of what you think the problem is. Uh, and they've specified those categories now more than they used to. So it's you know, uh, abuse, it's drug use, it's child pornography, it's you know, violence, whatever the, the particular category is. Um, and uh, justified both as a combination of a sort of commitment to free speech, we don't want to sort of shut something down before it sort of sees the light of day, and also a sort of practical problem, right? There's too much video, there's too much content. We couldn't possibly patrol all this content, so we don't, right? And we allow our users to sort of moderate for us. Uh, the director of content policy said, in the ideal world, I think that our job in terms of a moderating function would be really to be able to just turn the lights on and off and sweep the floors and that the community really would be able to do the self-regulation. But there are always the edge cases. That was what she added. Um, so a, a, a very particular gesture that it is the community that's moderating itself. That the community understands the guidelines and what's inappropriate, that they can use this flagging mechanism to enforce what the community is deciding is inappropriate. When videos are flagged, they go into a queue. That queue is not just organized by when things get flagged, but it's prioritized based on how many times the video has been flagged, what it's been flagged for. So something that's flag flagged for child pornography will go right to the top. Um, what the ratio of flags to views is, right? So if it's been viewed by four people, but it's been flagged by three, maybe that goes to a high priority. Um, and then they have a team of people, they will not specify how many people, um, who are looking at this content and making decisions about whether things should be removed. The guidelines, as you can see here, are again a kind of like folksy, non-legalese version of treat people right and don't put nasty stuff on our website, um, but specify out a series of categories and they've changed over the last couple years as sort of situations have emerged or uh, crit criticisms have developed um, about what can and can't uh, be sort of hosted by YouTube, what kinds of things that people, uh, people should flag and what they shouldn't. I would argue that YouTube, unlike Facebook and Flickr in this case, um, enjoy a kind of figure eight model of community governance. It's a very interesting one. So they look to users to patrol the site for them according to guidelines that they drafted. Users can comment on the guidelines, but the guidelines uh, change or not based on YouTube's decision about those complaints. Um, users can game the system, but YouTube can decide which of those flags are gaming and which ones are legitimate. Users can complain about removals, 
but YouTube points to the community as its justification for why things are removed. This is a very interesting and I think emerging model for how content is gonna be managed in these online spaces. And the, and the free speech argument and the practicality argument are very compelling reasons to do it. Now let's back up and point out that YouTube automatically searches for spam. Uh, that Facebook can proactively patrol the number of images that they're getting. So it may be disingenuous to say that YouTube can't do this. I don't want to propose that it would be easy, um, but it's a question. But what YouTube is doing is managing a, a real tension between playing host to a vibrant user community and governing what that community says and does, and a matching tension between counting on the community to say what it will and will not tolerate and training them to say it in the terms that are acceptable to their business model. Now theirs is a strategy that not only has practical value, and I think rhetorical value, to just sort of say what they're doing, but it also has legal value. Um, so it is um, helpful to YouTube to be able to say, we can't and therefore don't patrol content proactively. YouTube is facing a copyright lawsuit from Viacom. Viacom is saying that YouTube has been taking down videos when they're alerted, but not very quickly. And they're benefiting from the fact that they leave lots of copyrighted stuff on um, when in fact they could find it very easily. And YouTube says, the DMCA says we don't have to look for it. We are told when it's uh, there and we take it down. And we do it as diligently as we can. And here are all these mechanisms that we do so after the fact. Now if YouTube in fact could say that it could proactively find porn, then it makes it much harder for them in court to say that it could, can't proactively find copyright infringement. Right? So that very notion of we're merely a platform Right? We are simply an archive. We are simply a conduit for this content. We could respond to flagged you know, videos, that's fine. But for us to select the content, for us to editorialize, for us to um, guard against content going out there would be impossible. Right? So this rhetorical position has a great deal of legal value as well as uh, sort of uh, compelling value. Now I'd argue that the the kinds of boundaries that are being drawn about content, and more importantly, the techniques by which these sites are willing to engage in the removal or the age grading or the um, flagging of content, are quite important for how these archives exist, especially if those mechanisms are relatively opaque to us, relatively unavailable to us. That for our experience, most of the time, this is an archive full of stuff. When we search for things we want, we get uh, many, many results um, that seem all as relevant to us as we could imagine. But where the boundaries lie and where the rationalizations are for governing that community matter a great deal when we begin to think about edge cases. Let me raise a sort of fourth one, and this brings us back to um, YouTube's uh, a tube for all of us. So when I read this for the first time, and I read that thing about algorithmically demoting material, is it on there or did it get sort of blocked off? All right, I apologize if it's not in there, I'm not finding it. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so the algorithmic demotion, I thought, well, that's really interesting, right? So um, the algorithmic demotion would take videos out of the most viewed list, the most favorited list, the most discussed list. So the video would still be there in the archive, but these mechanisms by which some people find them, they would be invisible or unavailable. And I thought, what a weird way to sort of keep things kind of away from people, right? YouTube videos, sometimes we encounter them because people embed them in their blogs. Someone can send us a link directly to the video, right? But there's this search mechanism that somehow would sort of render them invisible. When I spoke to their director of content policy, she suggested a different reason for why they were doing that. And I, that doesn't mean they aren't doing it also for that reason, but the main reason was that that front page that you encounter for the first time is automatically populated using those mechanisms. Right, so you come to YouTube for the first time, they'd like to show you things that they think you'd like to watch, so they grab the most favorited, the most viewed, and they give you a smattering of things. Now, if you start to go there on a regular basis, or if you sign in, many of those videos are recommended to you based on your previous views, but some of them are, what's going on right now, what's the best? And what she said was, we don't want people to get to the front page and find a bunch of bikini videos. Right, so what we do is, we let them exist, and we take them out of the mechanisms that feed the front page. So this is not so far from what Flickr's doing, right? Not in, my, not in the public search area. Um, it's not so far from uh, you know, designing that front page to be sort of a careful representation and continuing to allow this stuff to exist. If you want bikini videos, you can find them, but they're not gonna show up on that front page as the first thing you encounter, the thing you associate with YouTube, the first moment that sets the terms for what this site is. 
But I would argue that it reveals and opens up a set of possibilities. And we, we've seen these possibilities more with Amazon. Um, so Amazon had a situation uh, where a bunch of readers suddenly noticed that a whole series of gay and lesbian fiction, not pornographic, but gay and lesbian themed fiction, had dropped off the bestseller list instantly. And they were books that were quite high on the list, shouldn't have suddenly been, you know, stopped selling, were just gone. And there was about a 48 hour period where um, first there, they thought there was a hacker and they thought Amazon had just sort of taken these things out. And then Amazon said, we're sorry, it was a glitch. A series of books got reclassified as adult. They weren't supposed to be adult. Adult is this category about sort of, you know, pornographic erotica and they got reclassified and therefore they didn't appear. And people sort of, you know, uh, critique this. This was the Amazon fail uh, critique. You can look it up if you want to. Um, one of the things it raised as a question for me was, that means that until this point, our experience of going to Amazon and looking up the bestseller list, which we might have thought was, what's the most highest selling book? What's the second most highest selling book? What's the third most highest selling book? Is in fact not. Right? It's a moderated list from within a set of appropriate categories of what's the most highest selling book, what's the most, second most highest selling book. The adult category, which these books did not belong in, but they slipped into accidentally, um, simply does not appear in that mechanism. So that access to Amazon, the bestseller list, which I think uh, many users would expect would be an algorithmic and straightforward measure of what people are buying, is in fact a semi-constructed list of what Amazon would like you to see people are buying. This is not a new phenomenon, right? So um, uh, sort of record sales and sales reports can exclude certain kinds of categories. Um, there are things that get left out of the reports about box office. And here's another place where the automatic categorization and then the automatic measure of things based on the categorization can be used to um, modulate what we encounter. And then you may have heard about this. So Amazon got in a little more trouble when uh, they decided that their copies of George Orwell's 1984 um, was, uh, was not within copyright for the person who provided for them to provide. Sorry, that wasn't clear. Um, they weren't sure that the people who had put George Orwell onto their archive actually had the rights to do it, and people had already bought this book. Um, and so their solution was to simply remove it from people's Kindles. So people woke up one day, they had bought George Orwell's 1984, terrible book to have done this with, um, and it was gone. <laughs> And that also meant things were gone like any notes that they had kept, any sort of, you know, if they, if they were annotating it, that was gone as well. And again, this is a situation where people called them on it, and Amazon, I think, sent them hard copies and basically said they'd never do it again. Um, but we are in an environment where our information space is not just the archive we go to, it's also on our sort of devices. Devices that we think of as in our own hands, owned by us, you know, something we've legitimately purchased, and yet that can be adjusted. Right? So technical measures that can remove from the available information content that has been decided to be inappropriate. In this case, a copyright violation, maybe, um, but certainly a technique that can be used for others. Um, sites have thought about stopping spammers and trollers and bad commenters by slowing the delivery of that site to those users or to making their comments only visible to them so they think they've commented but the comments aren't available to anyone else. Right? And these are legitimate techniques that are being considered right now about how they can modulate on a very granular level what information is available to whom under what conditions. Right? So whether we take our sort of traditional questions about removing certain content, where you draw lines in the sand about what's appropriate and what's inappropriate, how certain gray area cases fall on that problem, what age rating means and who you can then exclude from certain categories, who gets access to the restricted or inappropriate or moderate or whatever. Um, if we add to that two things, one, the dependence, the rhetorical and real dependence on the community, right, um, which is itself governed, but governed to become chaperones of its own content in the service of um, a platform, and the potential algorithmic mechanisms for removing particular kinds of content, um, isolating particular kinds of content behind certain barriers, and in a not just relatively oblique, but in potentially invisible way. So that your experience of the Amazon archive or the YouTube archive is simply an archive. And your awareness that certain things are missing um, is only dependent on someone having also noticed that something was missing and bringing attention to it. This raises new questions about how content is governed, right? how um, uh, the public discourse is regulated. 
Um, let me say one last thing, because in some ways, uh, this story has left out users. All right, so what are users doing in this environment? What's, the, what's left for users if this is, um, in some ways, the logical extension of these sites' financial obligations, political obligations, legal obligations, sense of how they should and can regulate their communities and regulate content, um, and the kind of compromises that they strike about what they think they can do, how they can do it, and f uh, with what implications. Users are playing a very interesting role. So on the one hand, in the YouTube example, they are the front line of regulation. They are the chaperones of content. Right now, it's a question of which users. We can't say that the entire YouTube community regulates the YouTube videos. It's a very active set of people, maybe people with a particular political agenda. Um, it differs as YouTube enter enters into different countries. Right? So there are really interesting questions about who actually flags and for what reasons. Um, we also can see how user groups, especially early user groups, early adopters for a platform, can set the terms for a site's trajectory, right? can establish a set of norms that the site needs to cater to or wants to cater to, and then becomes part of the DNA of that site, even as the site um, grows larger. We are seeing criticism and protests happening on the platforms themselves, so people criticizing YouTube's guidelines on YouTube, people criticizing the removal of breastfeeding images on Facebook. But I would argue, and this is where I'm sort of always left as a hesitation, that all of this activity, this sort of negotiation about appropriateness, about um, ownership of the dialogue, about the edge cases, while users are engaged in it, it may have a very particular role to play and may, in fact, be afforded the opportunity to take part in that regulation, that governance. That they're doing it on a terrain they didn't themselves build. Right? So the code itself, the community guidelines, the enforcement tactics, and also potentially the legal obligations were not theirs to begin with. Right? So both the negotiation with that terrain that itself sets the terms, but also the relative invisibility of elements of that terrain. What's being excluded? How is that algorithm being massaged? What categories are being represented and not represented um, are harder to grasp than um, a traditional media environment where something simply does not appear and it's clear that something that simply did not appear. Um, so I'll leave it at that, but I really appreciate questions. I'm sort of digging into this, and I would love to hear your feedback. Thank you. <clears throat> Should I field, or? Okay. Yeah. I don't know if they're trying to use any, especially for Flickr, image processing uh, image processing to actually scan the images to look for specific kinds of yeah so I've heard some discussion from a number of the sites about um, sort of porn recognition software um, YouTube again says it does not use it proactively but they do use it in the sense that um, when one of their content reviewers gets a queued video they get a site that looks a little different than what we see so they get a page that offers the video, it offers a series of flags and comments, all the ratios, and it also gets a sort of frame by, not like every five second frame, there's sort of a grid, um, so they can see, you know, they can look for things like, you know, what looks like pornography. Um, and they will run that through a porn filter and flag whether they think they have found pornography. Um, the, the, the porn classifying algorithms that are currently in existence are um, widely considered to be terrible. Um, so there's a lot of false positives. You get a lot of like babies um, and close-up portraits. Skin tones are, you know, are, uh, exist in other forms than pornography. Um, the, the harder thing that they admit is things like hate speech, right? Where you, know, it's, you need context, you have to listen to the whole thing. Um, and you know, it, to be fair to the, to the sites that are trying to do this, they're, they're very aware and willing to talk about the fact that this is a messy process, that there are these gray area cases and they, they meet on a weekly basis to talk about things that they can't just sort of automatically make decisions on, and they understand that this is sort of a, a murky category. Um, but the sort of automatic recognition things, I think, um, if they're in place, they're seen as, at best, an indication, but not something that should be automatically relied on. That may change as those algorithms change. Revolution, 
so sorry. Um, I remember seeing the Netta Sultani video linking from Flickr. I think I saw it on YouTube, and it definitely violated pretty much every, you know, term of service that was noted there. But also, it had this incredible potential politically, right? right? So I'm curious if you could speak to that yeah. because that's kind of the other side of what happens when terms are violated. Right? Isn't there some potential? benefit in some yeah, way there. Yeah. So certainly, um, the NetAvideo is a great example. Certainly these sites talk a, a great deal about um, publicly important materials, and that there are different exceptions for that. So um, the NetAvideo is certainly an example where they ran into this problem. Um, I'm not finding a lot of discussion online about whether it should or should not have been shown. It's, it's interesting, because it's sort of like, as, as violent as it is, you see a lot of discussion about how hard it is to watch. Um, but not a lot of discussion that it shouldn't be available. And YouTube went through a similar process, I spoke to them about it, um, that uh, you know, they decided to put a warning up, but they didn't want to remove it, even though on face value, it would sort of clearly violate their rules about graphic violence. Um, so these sites are also negotiating, this is another sort of side of the story, um, what their purpose is. And I think a lot of these sites, YouTube, Twitter especially, you know, it's very important for them to justify what they do. And part of the ways they can justify what they do is that they are an environment for politically relevant, publicly relevant content. Um, there's also another issue where, um, where part of the decision of whether content belongs there, if it's already been shown in other environments, then they make a kind of a different assessment. So I heard a story about um, a motocross accident that happened in South America where the guy did a big jump and, and was killed. He crashed and, and died. Um, and died in the hospital, but the footage, you know, the guy crashes and if you know he dies, it's a pretty gruesome video to watch. Um, but there was a discussion that once it had been on the news, then it was easier for them to go ahead and allow it because you could see it in other places. Which raises a very interesting question about, you know, is YouTube the only environment for video? Obviously it's not. Um, but the fact that they can then depend on a video's sort of presence elsewhere. So the Netta video, I think, had a combination of, you know, had been made into a clearly politically relevant topic, was seen as such, and so an exception was made about, um, you know, violence in that context, having a kind of relevance, a kind of political importance. Um, yeah, since you got the mic. Carlton, in a, in a lot of spaces, um, self-governance is encouraged by taking away anonymity. Mm. Right? Is that the more you, the more you think other people know who you are, yeah. the less um, bold you might be. Do, mm. do you see uh, mm. that being used as a tool at all? Um, and do you think a place like Facebook has a leg up in this area? Yeah, that is interesting. So, Facebook has a pretty strict policy about um, about uh, fake profiles, um, pseudonymous pro pseudonym profiles. Um, but, it, but it has largely, I don't know if it's thought of in, in those terms as a kind of regulatory mechanism. I think it, its legacy is that this was supposed to be a Facebook for particular universities and the whole point was that you would identify. Um, and they didn't want to, to get into that the way sort of MySpace allowed the creativity about that. Um, uh, so I, I don't, it'd be interesting to, to ask if that also has a sort of regulatory value. That's not the way they talk about it. Um, but it certainly does have that in other contexts. I, was, I wondered in part because Google seems to be moving into more and more opportunities for you to make sure and identify exactly who you are as a Google right. user as well, and it sure, sure, sure does save a lot of work if you, you know if, if people yep. can't be anonymous. You don't have to do as much work to govern them in some cases. So. Yeah, yeah. In some cases, I mean, I, you know, there, there's two things I think of the, about that. One is. Um, there are plenty of spaces that are not anonymous where they run into the problems, right? So it's not like Facebook is free of the kinds of material they think are inappropriate. Um, and the other is that uh, you know Google's attempts to link all your activity to your particular identity is not just a regulatory mechanism, right? So again, you can see those places where um, where the confluence of the ability to regulate and provide a sort of governed community and an ability to make a business where knowing each of your transactions belong to you then lets them further data mine your your activity and then target advertise to you. Um, so, so, you know, these things come out of um, a combination of interests. What's interesting in some ways is that as these sites get larger, the places where these decisions get made separate. So, you know, when this was, you know, six guys in a rented, a, a, you know, office, the, all these decisions were made by the same people. And increasingly you have divisions dedicated to content regulation, divisions dedicated to advertising, divisions dedicated to managing the algorithm. Um, nevertheless, I think there are, there are ways in which certain solutions solve multiple problems. Yeah. I, yeah, I was um, intrigued to hear you mention 
Google yeah. the search engine at the start of the talk, but wanted to hear more, particularly um, on two levels. Um, one, you said, well, this is actually just a fraction of what's out there, and, and this is a naive question, I guess, but what's, how small a fraction, and what's left out, and, and, and why? And then, and then there's an obviously an obvious way that they would be gatekeepers in in the page ranking system, right? Um, which we know about, which is what comes up on the first page and 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 how everything's ranked. Um, everything below, you know, the first 200 basically doesn't exist, you know, for for the purposes of the searcher. So, two questions really uh, on that first level: what just doesn't show up, and why? And on the other one, do we? know of cases where page rank doesn't, obviously they keep it secret, right, how exactly it works because they're trying to outgame spammers and stuff. But they promise us that all it's doing is, is, is measuring who's linking to what right. and, and using that, using the community out there, as it were, right. uh, as a way to regulate. Um, but have we heard any stories that contradict that? Right, right. So. Um, I'm, I'm not up on the numbers about the fraction. So, you know, there's historically the sense that um, search engines can't keep up with web production um, and that the mechanisms they engage in to sort of collect materials are necessarily imperfect. But I don't know um, what that fraction looks like. I think the bigger story is about sites that don't allow themselves to be searched, right? So lots of users don't know about robot.txt and don't know that sites could indicate that they shouldn't be archived. Um, so even for that reason, that's not a sort of Google decision, although to honor it, I suppose, is a Google decision, but, um, but a decision about sites and users sort of making their materials unavailable. So the experience of the search being a, the total glimpse of the web um, being, in fact, not the case. So, you know, in some ways, that doesn't raise questions yet for me about selection and intervention, but it does sort of highlight the fact that, it, that it's by necessity not the, the comprehensive archive. Um, so, so, you know, two things. One is, uh, about the second question, one is that um, whether the things below 100 searches are, are invisible or re irrelevant isn't yet a factor of sort of Google. It's also a factor of the way we use Google, right? So someone could presumably scan down page by page by page and find the 101st reference. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm reluctant to lump that into the same thing of YouTube saying this video does not belong in our archive. Although I think the bigger story that needs to be told, like the, the, I'm starting with removal guidelines, but things like how YouTube decides to feature certain videos is another way in which the open archive in, is in fact um, striated, right? It's, still, it's sort of built to be seen in a certain way. Um, and then you, ha you raise the question about sort of Google's you know, page rank and how it's presented and what we really get out of having 120,000 know, hits. hits. Um, the, the one example that I can think of is, um, is a very interesting one where it's not that Google made a choice per se, but that users reacted to what Google was offering and, and sort of criticized it was the Michelle Obama image dispute that was a couple months ago, where for a while, the, when you search Michelle Obama inside the image search, the first image that came up was a, um, a very uh, troubling, racist combination of Michelle Obama and a monkey um, Photoshop, photoshopped together. And a number of people were, pro, were, were asking Google to take this image down. Of course, Google was not actually hosting the image, but they could take it out of the search archive. Um, and on the other hand, you know, Google's position is kind of like, this is the algorithm, right? If this is the thing that's being linked to, then in some ways it is the highest ranked image, as, as reprehensible as you might think it is. Um, and what they decided to do was they decided to remove it um, from the search, but they indicated that something had been removed. Right, so that was sort of Google's compromise. It says, we don't want this there, um, but we don't want to be invisible about the fact that we've removed something. It opens the door to a whole, I mean, there's all sorts of material online that you might think is reprehensible. Um, Google came under fire from China when it introduced the, I can't remember the name of it, the, the page suggestion, the suggest mechanism. So you begin to type in the, in the search box, and if you type in a phrase, it'll sort of give you longer phrases that are the most searched for things. Um, and China was arguing that Google was providing porn. Because if you started a search and things came up and that those links were leading to pornography, then Google was facilitating pornography, right? So we're, we're in, I mean, that feels different, but it's in a universe of questions that I think are about what we hold these organizations responsible for, what we shouldn't hold them responsible for, what their selection process and their mechanisms 
do and do not do, facilitate and do not facilitate, and how those get us into the spaces that we've classically involved in with free speech questions, um, you know, cultural specificity questions, and a whole bunch of new questions that we haven't had to tackle quite so directly. Thanks. Yeah, right, sorry. How much responsibility is being pushed on the kind of algorithmic teams and algorithmic structure saying, well, you know, these are the kind of, you know, searches that we've done over the long period of time and our algorithms have shown that generally we're fairly correct. Or are they making different arguments about the, the kind of underlying structure of search um, and the, the rationales behind which things come up first, second, third, and, or the hundredth page? Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I think the I think the idea of relevance gets produced in the in the conversation a lot, right? So that that is the promise of the of the Google PageRank, right? That the most relevant searches, and when they talk about what it is, I, I agree. The PageRank itself is sort of kept relatively under wraps, but this idea that it's based on other people's, you know, the links coming into a page and the links whether they're coming from particularly highly respected pages themselves. Um, so there's there's a kind of promise around the algorithm that it offers relevance. To me, I think about relevance the way I think about newsworthiness, right? Like, you know, it, it is of course the job of a journalistic organization to decide on newsworthiness, but a newsworthiness is not a, you know, a fact of things, it's an assessment of things. Um, and it's exactly the place where, where social assumptions, ideological assumptions, you know, um, professional routines will enter into that. And what counts as newsworthy will um, be shaped by those forces. So a process that is fully intended to do what they think is newsworthy, and they think their economic interest is in fact newsworthiness, right? Leave off the like, my parent company is in you know, legal hot water and whether we should cover it. But in general, um, a business would like to strike the right chord of what you thought was newsworthy is what they thought was newsworthy, and they, they matched one to one. Um, but there's no way in which newsworthiness can be judged as a, as a you know, a fact of the, of the world, right? It's always a social assessment. And I think in some ways relevance is playing a similar role. Um, you know, what we take to be relevant is both experiential, they can't really know what every user finds as relevant. Um, you can't know that before you create the algorithmic design. Um, so I think that's a place where um, what seems relevant to whom could be asked, right? Um, and again, that's not a sort of like, these are bad guys sort of, you know, deliberately manipulating offers. And I think they are in fact trying to strike that one-to-one -one correspondence, right? That perfect, seamless experience of relevance. Um, but whether you actually can do that is a different question. And that's a place to me where selection comes in, right? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. sort of rule-based structures mean for quality of content or diversity of content? Yeah, yeah. I, I, my, my first gloss is that I think it's going to be a, a really interesting parallel um, question to ask. So, you know, if, if, if what we're thinking about is private hosts who build businesses on third-party provision of content, right, um, and that that content comes from a lot of different places, it looks like a lot of different things, it varies from obviously appropriate to edgily not appropriate to downright you know, reprehensible, um, and that they're under the same kind, you know, a, a same set of economic pressures, legal liabilities, sort of sense of you know, community and obligation, that, that you'd ask similar questions. Um, and, and I think there's even another layer, I mentioned this to a couple of people before, where we're gonna see applications that themselves depend on other user contributions. So the example, I think we talked about this, was, um, was augmented reality uh, applications. So Layer builds a service that says you can look through your iPhone camera and it will map information on, but it's gonna allow users to provide layers of information. So you want restaurant recommendations, someone designed that layer, and you could sort of decide which layers go on. Well, you can imagine, right, like, you know, here's, here's all the sort of like graphic drawings of pornography that have been sketched onto, you know, virtual walls and you can walk around the city and see, you know, pornographic graffiti. Is that appropriate, is it not? Did you choose it or did not? Is that, you know, what is layer trying to be? Is that gonna be, you know, a, a problem for them or not? Um, so I think in some ways the app environment is, is a similar set of questions. Um, so, you know, 
then we have the question, you know, uh, we want to ask about whether they are in some ways different, right? What are the differences between YouTube needing to regulate the total archive, what they're willing to do, what they should do, what they can't do, what it's legally smart to do, and, um, and whether Apple faces exactly the same questions, whether there's things specific to apps that, um, that play differently than content. Um, right now, my tendency is to think of them as very parallel questions. But I'd be intrigued to hear if people think there are specific differences about how that question would play out differently. Other questions? to uh, sell themselves as like democratic platforms and to market themselves in that way. And I guess my question is, um, to what extent do you feel like it's possible that they might have like drank their own Kool-Aid? And like, I mean, do you think that there's also, do you think that those are also operating inside of those corporate structures as like guiding principles? Or do you think it's like totally cynical or some combination of the two? No, I. So, so I've had a lot of uh, academic training to take apart commercial organizations, right? There's a whole you know, world of sort of political economy of media that says you, know, you have to understand why these structures exist. And, and, and the risk when it's done badly is you know, these are you know, bad guys, they're, you know, they're operating to sort of control and sort of benefit. And I, and I think that, that does a disservice to understanding why it persists, right? Um, it's, it's an old trope to say Google says don't be evil. I think they believe that, right? Um, I think they would like that. I think that's a sort of principle that they would like to live by. Um, that doesn't mean they don't fail sometimes, right? Of course, you can always fail to meet your corporate mission. But I think the trickier thing is it, drinking the Kool-Aid is one way to get to it, but it's kind of like um, inside of this process, right? As the process emerges, as the business develops, as the you know situations arise, as the back and forth between users and between regulators develops, um, and, a, and a business model emerges amidst that. I think the, the tendency and why we see organizations and structures kind of drift in a certain direction is that it starts to make a kind of sense internally, right? And that's not just internal to the corporation, but internal to the discourse, right? So if you think of yourself as broadcast yourself, and that's what your service is, and there's a certain kind of sense of things that you would do that would make sense. If you then pursue, well, you know, we could get corporate partners and we could compete with Hulu, right? So let's get, you know, TV networks to put stuff on and let's get movies to, you know, demo here. Um, then there's a set of economic pressures, economic sort of logics that I think infuse the conversation. So now certain kinds of solutions make sense. They don't make sense because they were, you know, because they're false and, and devious. They make sense because um, within the viewpoint of getting all these things done, they do make the most sense, right? They do seem to be the right way to achieve the goal they'd already articulated, but it's already been sort of shifted through the lens of what they've been doing. That's sort of a murky way to say it, but I, you know, I, rather than sort of seeing it as like, genuine and total failure, devious and manipulative, I think there, there is a power to structures, right? And those structures have history and they have discourse. And those things are quite strong for how certain ideas then circulate inside of them and start to make a kind of sense. Uh, even if from the outside you would say those things seem counterintuitive or contradictory. Great, thank you.